E a gente finaliza com os aspectos éticos uh, com o Dr. Fernando Godoy, que é advogado, especialista em direito médico. Uh, então essa é a, é a programação de hoje. De novo, né, algumas orientações com relação à utilização da ferramenta. Do lado inferior esquerdo das apresentações existe um QR Code. Esse QR Code ele pode ser escaneado de qualquer celular durante todo o tempo das apresentações e ele direciona direto a um link de doação para uma campanha da Fiocruz uh, de combate à Covid. So Alex, we uh, just uh, uh, explaining here that we have a QR code under the left uh, hand side of the presentations and these guides to a, a donation campaign that uh, fundraisings for Covid fight. So <clears throat> if you could stimulate people to do to be uh, great. As ferramentas que nós temos são a ferramenta Q&A, que é a ferramenta de perguntas e respostas. É através dessa ferramenta que os convidados vão interagir. A ferramenta de bate-papo, que é para conversações livres, mas não é focada em respostas, em perguntas e respostas oficiais. É uma ferramenta de conversação livre. E se você quer fazer alguma pergunta pessoal a um dos palestrantes no final da apresentação, a gente, no geral, pede para que na hora que a gente abre, que você posiciona o final de levante as mãos e aí a gente faz a abertura do áudio para que as perguntas sejam feitas. So Alex, just uh, for you to understand, the Q&A will be the channel for questions and answers. Uh, and if it's after your presentation, if there's any question that you can uh, uh, help to answer with the Q&A uh, uh, option, will be great. And raise the hands is the open the microphone for uh, personal questions after the presentation. So we're going to have an open uh, space for uh, uh, questions, uh, voice uh, questions after each presentation. So I think we're ready to start. Uh, eu vou passar a palavra para o Dr. Pimenta, que vai fazer a introdução do Alex Vaccaro e dar início nessa nossa sessão de hoje. So, oh, thank you very Boa noite much. a todos. Yeah. Boa noite a todos. Uh, Alex, I'm introducing you in Portuguese, ok? Uh, uh, eu estou só um minuto da, da, do nosso tempo para introduzir o Alex, que é um amigo pessoal meu uh, e que eu tive e tenho relacionamento constante com ele, é uma mente brilhante, é um cara que pensa muito fora da casinha uh, e exatamente por isso ele está aqui no nosso painel. Ele é nesse momento o chefe da Jefferson uh, e se vocês quiserem visitar a Jefferson, não pensem que vocês vão achar o Alex uh, na Jefferson. O Alex sempre vai estar tá no no Starbucks in front, in, in front of Jefferson, never a Jefferson, on the Starbucks. Uh, that's my introduction to you, Alex. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Luiz. It's an honor to be here. I think this is an amazing opportunity to get together. It was so easy. There's no jet lag. None of us are tired and we're all drinking wine. So let's enjoy. So I'm going to share my screen uh, right now. My presentation, and I was asked by Gabriel to talk about telemedicine, and it's fortuitous that we talk about telemedicine because it's a technology that is so pertinent in today's pandemic. Louis and I tend to be older surgeons. Uh, older surgeons tend to get comfortable in what we do. We tend to not really take risks in terms of adopting new technologies. Uh, and I've seen that in our careers. Lee was a pioneer in introducing new surgical techniques to the world. <clears throat> he did that as a young man, and he continues to do that as he gets older. But that's not normal uh, for an older surgeon. Surgeons, as they get older, become more comfortable in what they do. They become more selective in the pathologies they treat. They become uh, more reticent to adopt new methods. And all of a sudden, we're hit with a pandemic where we can't go outside, where the hospitals are closed down. And the very people who are asked to serve the world's public to protect them are basically put out of business. If you look at what happened in my institution, Thomas Jefferson University, 
in the month of April, my institution lost 89 million American dollars. And in the month of April, we lost $439 million. And that's because we were not allowed to do elective surgery. So the only way to keep in touch, to stay connected, was through technology, and that's telemedicine. My only introduction to telemedicine was four or five years ago when we started to think that new technology would be the future. And we started to do four studies, intercervical decompression and fusion, lumbar discectomies, lumbar decompression and fusion, and arthroplasty. And we started to follow patients with telemedicine in the post-operative period. And I thought it was really, really, really a good technology because you do the surgery, you don't see them back again in the office, and you have a time on your calendar that tells you when to meet the patient. So I want you to keep that in mind, a time on your calendar when to meet the patient. So the first headache was, sometimes I'm not ready to meet the patient. I'm, I'm doing something, I'm in a meeting, I'm in the operating room, I'm seeing patients. So that was the first thing I didn't like about telemedicine. At 10.05 a.m., I have a telemedicine post-operative view. And then you'd go over to, to a computer, you'd see the x-ray, you'd see the patient, you'd talk to them. That was pretty easy. The patient didn't have to drive in, the patient didn't have to park the car, the patient didn't have to pay for parking, and you were able to examine the patient but we had a few problems. Insurance companies in America wouldn't reimburse it because you didn't get to do a face-to-face -face physical examination. So we had no validated physical exam. So these are the, the things we were up against, and then it sort of died out. It was popular four years ago, and then it died out. And then all of a sudden, no one could come into the city anymore to be seen. And we were told we had telemedicine. Now we have to deal with the political dilemma and the legal dilemma of what telemedicine meant in the United States. In my country, we have 50 states. You cannot do a telemedicine interview with someone across into another state. So I'm on the border of New Jersey and I'm on the border of Delaware and I'm in Pennsylvania. I have patients in New Jersey, New York, Delaware. I can't talk to them because they're in a different state. Two, you don't get paid for it if you don't have a video image and three, it has to be HIPAA compliant, which means it has to be approved by the government to protect sensitive information. So now it's a headache. But when the pandemic hit, the one, hit, the one thing I noticed around the world was when we saw what happened in China and then we saw what happened in Italy, we said, we have a problem. And then all of a sudden it knocked on our back door in New York and people started to die very quickly. And the government came out and said, all rules are gone. All rules are gone. You can now do telemedicine anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be HIPAA protected. You don't even have to have a visual. It doesn't have to be a televisit. It could be an audio visit. So that's what led to where we are now. And all of a sudden, telemedicine is my best friend because now things are loosening. We went through two and a half months where we couldn't go out, and now we're opening up. And I am never, ever, ever getting rid of telemedicine. And I do it a little bit different than most people, like everything else. Like Louis took a way to approach the anterior spine and he came up with a different way of doing it. Telemedicine doesn't have to be the telemedicine that we were taught. It can be different. And I want to go over that. So it's basically using technology, electronic data across the distance to communicate we do everything by telemedicine now. After I have a discussion about the clinical needs, my PA gets on and sends information. I can do training. And I do all my medicine now related to healthcare through technology, and that's telehealth. So telemedicine, telehealth. What we're doing now is synchronous, but we're using the apps on our iPhone and the gyrometer to track objective patient data and then we're also using a concept called gamification where I want to follow my patients. So I send, if I find out they're a wine lover, if they're a car enthusiast, if they're a stamp collector, we use gamification to find out the interests of a patient and we send them a, a tidbit of fact and they get back to us on how they're feeling. Did they change their medication from zero to 10? How's their pain? So that's asynchronous. And we take that information and we've gone a little bit further. It is a pain in the neck to do a telemedicine physical examination. It takes too much time. So we've modified how we do telemedicine. My physician assistant or my nurse contacts the patient, gets the information. We send them a YouTube video 
on how to do an examination. They do their own examination, the different muscle groups, and they send it back to us. So when we sit down to do it, we have the exam done already, and then we just talk to the patient and we get right down to the money. Now, we don't use the computer. We use our iPhones and apps that allow us to see a video image that we can hook into our PAC system. And we use FaceTime to talk to the patient as we go back and forth so we can communicate with the patient. So now no longer, and, and we don't set a time. We say to the patient, just like a, a uh, utility, like a washing machine salesman, we say, we're gonna call you between the hours of eight in the morning and 10 in the morning. And I'm doing my responsibilities. I'm in the operating room. I go visit a patient. And then I do three telemedicine visits on my phone. I text them, are you ready? I have their HMP, I have their images. I discuss with them. And the second I'm done, I press med tech and I dictate my note on the patient. So that's how we've changed telemedicine. We take iPads that have an encrypted phone number in it so the patient can text their imaging studies to us. We tell them to videotape their MRI scans and CT scans. They text it to our iPad so we can talk to them. So that's what we're doing now. This all began during the space race with Russia, 1961, Progret Mercury, when we decided that if you went into space, something bad would happen to your circulation and respiration. So we used telemonitoring back then in all the different space flights. And that was very successful. Then when NASA lost funding, we decided to set up telemedicines for remote Indian villages throughout the country. But of course, we had state laws to deal with and they said, no, 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 you, you, can't, you can't go across straight state lines. So NASA used Indian reservations in the early 60s and 70s to perfect telemedicine. And then the VA system is our largest healthcare system in America. It's 52% of the American healthcare system. And telemedicine is used all the time. And when I trained in my fellowship in San Diego, all the vets, the American vets, would, would live in Mexico because it was inexpensive on the beach. And they'd drive up the coast to the VA hospitals to get care. Now with telemedicine, they don't even have to drive up anymore. They could live in Mexico and do telemedicine. So it's one of the, the positive things about the VA system. You've heard a lot of negatives about the VA system. It's one of the positives. Now, if you look at this world map, Southeast Asia, Australia, extremely well accepted, extremely well permeated in their society. South America and Africa is just starting to take over with telemedicine. We're the largest market in terms of finances, but we're just slowly getting into it. And, and, and the way we've incorporated now in the spine practice is that there's so many patients I do not want to see in my office. Very difficult follow-up patients with bad personalities, patients that are far away, and patients that may not, not, may not need to see a spine surgeon. So those are the patients that are perfect for me. So every day I'm having 10 patients I do telemedicine. I had someone yesterday from Colorado, two people from California. You're not gonna operate in those people, but they want your opinion. So I do it between cases. So I see, I'll see a patient in the office, I'll do a telemedicine. When I travel now, if I have to drive five or six hours and there's connectivity, I'll do telemedicine. So no longer can we use the excuse I'm an academic professor. My practice is getting killed because I travel a lot. When you're in your hotel room at a meeting and you have to give a, a one-hour speech, you can literally do telemedicine in your hotel room, 10 people, so your practice doesn't stop. You can sign someone up for surgery. So this is great, great technology to maintain a practice if you're developing it. And if you can look at the global predictions, 21 billion 2015 by 2025, 266 billion dollar market. And people are knocking on my door every day with a new product. So it's out there. So let's look at a few things. Let's look at its safety. Is telemedicine safe? I'm gonna go through some illustrative articles and then I'm gonna rate the literature. In fracture care, in new consults, 
in follow-up care for general elective orthopedic found to be safe. So we've proven in randomized controlled studies, it is safe. No adverse events. In terms of transfers, and I'm at a spinal cord injury center. I always get irritated that I get a phone call at 10 o'clock at night. A patient gets sent to me at one o'clock in the morning. I get on the phone and I realize the patient isn't what was billed to me by the tr transferring institution. And I say, well, that cost $10,000. It cost $5,000 to get into an ambulance. That was a waste of $10,000. Even though I spoke to a doctor at a transferring center. With telemedicine, these two studies showed that you can remove a significant amount of transfers by being able to talk face-to-face -face and seeing in the images and so forth. And in South America, where the distances are long, you can have a telemedicine, this is a study from Chile, with an orthopedic surgeon who says, listen, that doesn't have to be transferred. In fact, I could do a telemedicine on that patient. And out of those telemedicines, only a third of those have to be transferred. And you can shorten the time period between waiting and seeing a patient in the office. So unnecessary transfers significantly affected. Patient access, this is a reflection of what I just said before. Before telemedicine, people get sent in all the time. That was a bad transfer, that was a good transfer, that was a waste of a helicopter ride, that was a waste of a, waste of a fixed wing aircraft transfer. With telemedicine, the admission rates increase because you screened all the people that did not have to be transferred, so you're saving a tremendous amount of money. In randomized controlled studies evaluated by the physicians, where they did a telemedicine, then they did a standard face-to-face -face examination, then after the fact they looked at the data from both, almost 100% said this was just as good as a face-to-face -face examination. In terms of effectiveness and patient preference, when a patient doesn't have to get into a car, if you're working at a job that you just got, you've been quarantined for two and a half months and you have a job, do you want to now tell your boss you've, you've got to go for an appointment to see an orthopedic surgeon? Not going to happen. Your boss is going to say, listen, you can't do that. I need you back. The vast majority of patients love the fact that they could do telemedicine and it was their preference, except if you want to be face-to-face. -face. Now, remember, there's always a subset of patients that you have to sit down with, you have to hold their hand, you have to make contact. Those are those nervous, anxious patients. Those are patients that may not have had a good outcome. Those are patients with complications. Telemedicine doesn't replace that. You have to be face to face, but people love it. If you look at satisfaction, this was, this was an interesting study. Now, this is in the joint orthoplasty. Now, how does it serve you and I well if you and I do a telemedicine but then the patient doesn't feel satisfied, so they call your nurse 12 times, and they call you at night at 2 o'clock in the morning on your cell phone. This study looked at doing additional telemedicine interviews in addition to a face-to-face, -face, and they showed that unscheduled visits were decreased, and phone calls, which can take so much time, dropped significantly. So it's effective in that respect. We use telemedicine in rounding at Thomas Jefferson University at 9 a.m. in the morning, when all the surgeons are in the operating room or in clinic, the on-floor physician assistant walks around with an iPad to each patient's room, and at that point, any family member can call in to that iPad and have a face-to-face -face telemedicine with the medical care team and the patient, so all their questions can be answered. Another great idea, telerounding. We were sitting there, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, you set a set time, because how many times do you get phone calls? The family doesn't know what's going on. The family's not getting information. What's going on? Why is he still in the hospital? Why is he not in the hospital? Why are you being discharged? With telerounding, you can sit down, set a time during the day, have your nurse go over, and you tell all the family members, every day at 9 a.m., we're going to do telerounding. Very, very, very effective. Now, I say this all the time, and I'm going to whisper it to you now. I love when I hear a debate. Well, did you examine the patient? Usually the older professors say that. Did you examine the patient? And I sit back and I say, 85% of the time, I know the diagnosis by the history and the MRI scan. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I know exactly if I'm going to operate or not operate. I don't even have to see the patient. And that's what we are exploiting now. The vast majority of time, unless you're differentiating between hip disease and sciatica 
shoulder pain, rotator cuff, and radiculopathy. It doesn't happen that often. Someone has left leg pain and they've got a massive L4-5 disc herniation, you're operating, looking at that MRI scan and taking the history. So don't fool yourself that you're the big professor. The vast majority of the time, you can make the diagnosis. Now, the economics. If your university goes out and gets a vendor that charges you a million dollars, you can pay the million dollars. I just went over with you a simple app you can place on your iPhone to do telemedicine. You could take, you could take FaceTime. You could take Android, Google, and do, and do telemedicine as long as it's encrypted, as long as you have that information. So there is a tremendous amount of burden if you do it the right way. But if you do it the old-fashioned way and figure it out yourself, it's not that expensive to do. Now, in terms of looking at cost effectiveness, these are, I want to show you some studies that came out. The cost of a transfer. Well, this study showed the cost of a transfer is $1,269. I don't know where they got that number from. If I take an ambulance from one side of Philadelphia to the other, that's $7,000. If I get on a helicopter, that's $17,000. If I do a fixed plane, that's $25,000. So the cost of a transfer is incredibly expensive. And if telemedicine prevents that from happening, you're saving a lot of money. In that Canadian study that I showed you where 65% of people didn't have to be transferred, that saved these Canadian physicians over $5 million in the time period of that study. It is tremendous. Now, if you look at the Scandinavian countries that study everything, they looked exactly at what point would be cost effective to go from telemedicine to in-person. They said, once you hit 151 examination, it pays for itself. They've got the numbers wrong. It's a lot earlier than that, but that's in a Scandinavian country. And they noticed that they saved 21,000 American dollars doing it. Now, this is the thing that I love. I have to do dental work. I got an x-ray. They said, oh, you got this problem with your tooth. You need to have your tooth operated on. The date of my uh, visit was supposed to be April 12th. I go, that's not happening. I'm not going to the dentist and getting the COVID virus. That's not going to happen. I go, who knows where your dentist has been? Your dentist is looking at everyone. If anyone has the virus, it's your dentist. So I said to myself, I'm not going to the dentist. It's not going to happen. This is the reason why guys like myself like telemedicine. I would love never to go to my doctor, have my labs drawn, have an x-ray taken, talk to the guy. He can explain my labs on the telephone, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't need it. I could put one of those monitors on my heart and use my iPhone to get my pulse rate of my heart. But until I'm 75, this is the way I want to go, telemedicine. Now, looking at a particular patient's life, how does a patient like it? Well, let's take a look at this study. Time required to take time off of work. 60% of people had to take time off from work because doctors don't have night hours or weekends. Distance traveled. I'm in Philadelphia. Most of my patients are two and a half hour drives for me. 53 miles, these people traveled. Now, the reason why it says 14 miles for telehealth is because, believe it or not, up until this crisis, believe it or not, you could not do a telemedicine and get paid for it if the patient was at their house. Medicare said the patient has to go to a designated medical facility that has an on-site medical personnel to be hooked up to a machine to do tele It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. So that's why it says 14 miles. And then, then the time that it takes a patient, almost three hours. So that, this is classic. So you look at the world's literature. I put it all together, the report card. It's all level four studies, a couple level two studies, and mostly opinion studies. It's B, B minus the evidence, but I love the evidence. Safe, effective, and cheap. It's the future. And for the young surgeons, you can build your practice. Because remember, you want to be the triple threat. You want to be an educator. You want to be a researcher. You want to be a clinician. And with an educator and a researcher, you have to travel. And you know what that kills? Your practice. And that's where the money comes from your practice. Unless you work for a university that has the money to pay you to travel, and guess what's happening to universities during this COVID crisis? They don't have the money anymore. So you want to be able to use this technology, which is good. Now, I was telling you how archaic and asinine the state regulations were. You could not do telemedicine with a patient in their home. They had to go to a special place. You had to have an on-site 
healthcare professional. You couldn't talk to someone across the state. It doesn't make any sense. Now, with the executive order from the president, all the rules are gone. You get paid for it. It could be a new patient. It could be a follow-up. It could be a short e-visit. It could be a virtual visit. You get paid. It could be a virtual check-in, five, 10 minutes. It could be, an, you could send an email now and get paid for it. The greatest thing in the, so this is a positive thing from a legal perspective, and this is how you monetize it. Before, you could not see a new patient from Medicare over telemedicine. You couldn't see a new patient. So grandma had to be driven into your office, which was so stupid. Because a lot of time, grandma doesn't want surgery. She just wants an opinion on what you think so the kids will just shut up and get off her back. So now you could do it by tele telemedicine. Now, before the pandemic, you didn't get paid for any of it. Now we're getting paid, and it's getting paid at the same rate as an in-person, which is phenomenal. And all the insurance companies are following along. Now, here's the two headaches I have with the insurance companies in America. I have been operating for the last two and a half months doing emergencies. So people call up, I got a foot drop. I can't lift my right arm up. So you do the telemedicine. Okay, I, I think you'd benefit from having pressure taking off your nerve. I literally had six times the insurance companies say, we can't approve that because you didn't do a face-to-face -face physical examination. And I would say, I'm not allowed to do a face-to-face -face because the governor just said, I can't do a face-to-face and he doesn't want people in the emergency room, and I'm doing a telemedicine. So that's one of the criminal acts of insurance companies. And the other criminal act was they don't want to pay because the money's in their pockets. So they said, I think you need a second opinion. I'm like, we're in a pandemic, and the guy's getting paralyzed. How's this guy going to get a second opinion? So these are the headaches that I have. The other thing, some of the medical malpractice carriers are not covering you for telehealth. Because they're like, well, you know, we can't really be sure you're doing a good exam. You know, you don't really, have, yeah, we're not going to cover you. So you got to make sure you're covered. And I don't know what the medical legal situation in Brazil is, but make sure you're covered because that would be a real pain in the neck. So I'm going to go over a little study we did. But before I talk about this, these are the opportunities I just want to review. Office, post-operative visits, follow-up visits, tele-rounding when you're traveling on a trip. It's phenomenal. Now, these are screenshots that I took of my office. This is every day. This is, if you go back to the first day, it says March 16th. March 16th, the governor says, uh, okay, you can't see anyone in the office anymore. And boom, all the patients went down. And you see the orange? That's me starting to do telemedicine. I'm like, what? I didn't know how to do telemedicine. And all of a sudden, I'm trying to figure it out. So you could see how consults went down and they started to go up. Follow-ups started to go up. New patients started to go up, and then I started to operate. And these are each day. So you can see how the crisis destroyed our practice, and then we started to slowly, slowly inch up. NYU got hit the hardest. Mount Sinai, NYU, Northwell. They saw, over a six-week period, 145,000 televisits, which is phenomenal. Their patient volume went up 4,300. When you don't have to travel to a doctor, you can literally see more patients in a day. So say if you're a spine surgeon and you see 35 patients a day, you can see 50 because it only takes about six or seven minutes unless you've got a psychotic patient who likes to talk. You can get through it pretty quickly. So you can see a lot more patients. So I'm not going to play this video, but I was so excited about it. I had to teach all the guys in my group how to do this because we're, we're stupid orthopedic surgeons. So this is the video I made for my guys. Tell me if you could hear this. Hi, I'm Alex Vicaro, the president of Medical Medicine. Louis, can you hear it? And today, we're yeah. Patients, how easy it is to use. So you can see the scar on my nose from my N95 mask. I'm not going to play it. So, so I go over it. So I, this goes out to all my, so. If you cut to here, so I, I tell them, I do the picture screen. I tell them what button. I mean, we're, we're orthopedic surgeons, so we have no idea what we're doing. I go everything. And then I, I have my buddies filming a patient who I'm talking to, and she's going over exactly how to do it. So I made it so simple 
for a patient to do. And we go through, and then, and then as I cut through it, I show the surgeon how to tap into their PAC system to bring up the x-rays from whatever system has the x-rays, the university, a local, so I go over the whole thing. And this is, uh, and this is a, how, how many minutes is that? Ten, uh, four minutes, there's a four minute video on how to do it. And it's a step-by-step -step tutorial for all the orthopedic surgeons in my group on how to do it. So the last hurdle we have, and I want you to think about this, is how do you do a validated examination? And how do you make it really count? Now, we, have, we went down two paths. One was a path where we show a patient how to do range of motion, how to test every single nerve root with objects that they have in their house, like a full glass of wine. Anything you have, like lifting things up, lifting a bottle of milk. So that's for you have no tools. And then we have a kit that I'm going to show you here. So what we did was we took three things. We took bands, Sim Murphy filaments, and some hand grips. And we were able to do a complete neurologic examination on a patient. So we had 20 controls and we had 20 patients with spine pathology. We had an orthopedic surgeon do an exam, the patient rested. We had a physiatrist do the exam, the patient rested. Then we taught the patient in detail how to do the exam at home. And then we used a GoPro where we, vi we videotaped it. Now, I'm gonna show you how to rate strength. If you knew the elasticity of a band, and you know the angle that you're lifting a known stretch band, and you could calculate the angle, you could determine strength. It's a little, it's a physics calculation. So we tested all these different myotomes in the upper and lower extremity. And this is the examination. These are all the different nerve roots we tested. And that's how we tested it. We did it for the lower extremities. And then we calculated the angle. Now, if a person, and we knew, we knew the elasticity and the force necessary to move the band because they're all standardized. If they could just lift it against gravity, it was a three. If they can get to a certain angle, it was four. If they could lift it above their head, it was five. So we did all the calculations. And believe it or not, people have done studies on this. So we imported that information from the physics literature. And then we did sensory testing, all the different dermatomes. And we had people test it. And the only two things we couldn't do is we couldn't do reflexes and we couldn't do the rectal. Although we had a lot of people volunteering for the rectal, but we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. And then we did test for myelopathy rapid alternating movements, toe walking, heel walking, tandem gait. We put it all together, ran statistics, univariate, multivariate, and we found there was no difference. Telemedicine gave us an accurate examination. So what can we use this for? We're a spinal cord injury center. No longer do we have to ask paraplegics and quadriplegics to come back anymore. They could be examined at wherever they live with, the assist with an assistant helping them out. If we want to do an examination with you down in South America, we would use the other video where we just tell you how to do all your exam with just household objects because this costs $15 to get this kit. So if you want to do research and, and the patients don't have the money or you don't have the funding to bring them back, that's the way to go. And if you just want to do a normal examination, remember, do the examination the day before, have them videotape it so you don't waste time on the telemedicine. It's all about time efficiency to get them on and off. So. In my practice, post-op visits, between surgical cases, between office visits, travel, and conferences. And we're using wearable technology now. My patients have apps on them that I, I see their activities. I get a subjective response. We're seeing it with bandages. We're seeing it with all sorts of monitors. It's the future. And in our office, we're using 3D printing, where we ask patients that need splints, if their splint breaks down, if they want another splint, we ask them to put a quarter on their wrist. They could tape a quarter to their neck. They could tape a quarter. And we use artificial intelligence to image their body so we can see exactly the size. And we get an off-the-shelf 3D printed thing through telemedicine, and we send it to the patient. So in the day, it would cost $1,000 to have an orthotist fit a brace. This costs $23 to do.
and it's easy to do. It's not complicated. So I'm a dinosaur. I don't like to do things I'm not comfortable with. I can't stand computers. I love this technology. And it took a pandemic and everyone dying around me to try to get creative, to use this technology to bring more patients into my office, to not let me fall behind when I travel academically, to not let me hate the fact that when I get back, I have 700 people in my office. This weeds them out. I can screen people I don't want to see. This will be the future for research, for patient visits. We just have to make sure when the insurance companies see how easy it is, they don't screw us and reimburse us a lot less to see these patients in the office. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, any, any, questions, any questions? Yes, I have a question. Can I do the first? Yeah, should I, should I stop sharing my screen? I'll stop, I'll stop sharing my screen. I think, I think so. Okay, good. So stop sharing it. Okay, hit me with the question. So we, we have a question for, from the audience uh, asking about the reimbursement on telemedicine and, and regular face-to-face uh, -face, uh, consultations in U.S. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go over that. So here, so I participate in all insurances. So an average insurance for a new patient in my office in American dollars, I'll get $260. So you ready for this? Before the crisis, if you get a new patient on telemedicine, you can't do telemedicine, new patient Medicare. They would only pay you $15 to do telemedicine. So $260 and $15. Now, President Trump signs an executive order. Everything's $250 now. When this, when his this executive order is pulled back, it's going to be lopsided. Unless, unless we fight it, which we're going to fight it. So that's going to change me. Since you don't pay me to do something, guess what? An orthopedic surgeon who doesn't get paid to do something is not going to do something. So if you don't get paid to do it, you're only going to use it for those examples that I told you, travel, when you're at a conference. You're not going to be changing your office hours over this technology because you'll, you'll, go, you'll go out of business. But there's got to be parity and reimbursement. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I do have a personal question, actually. You mentioned uh, a little bit on uh, what your uh, selection for face-to-face -face visits, uh, and you mentioned the patient who needs the, the contact and patients with anxiety and other uh, uh, psychological disturbs that needs that type of face-to-face uh, uh, -face contact. But what do you... We, you would say that is the checklist or what are your criteria for selecting a, a, a personal consultation instead of a, a, a telemedicine consultation? So if it's a long distance, if the patient's coming anywhere more than five hours, that'll be a telemedicine because that's, you know, I don't want to inconvenience the patient. And if I think it's a surgical candidate in telemedicine, I'll probably bring it to the office. But remember, a lot of the people that see the older spine surgeons in America that have a reputation, they've seen four or five different spine surgeons. Mm -hmm. So you can take that one or two ways. I'm not going to waste my time because this person has seen five other famous spine surgeons, and why should I waste my time? That's a perfect telemedicine patient. Because, you know, I'm going to sit there for 45 minutes, and the guy's going to go and see someone else. I don't want to waste my time. So the whole thing about my office hours and, and, and everyone's office hours you want to have a high conversion rate. So a, a very talented, famous joint surgeon should have a conversion rate of 1.2 to 1. For every 1.2 people they see, they should sign up one person. Spine surgeon, who's a famous spine surgeon, it could be 1 to 3. Because a lot of times, even though everyone else said they need spine surgery, you don't want to operate on them. I mean, it's all about in my practice. You may have something that I can operate on, but if I don't like you, if you're addicted to narcotics, I think you're litigious. I'm probably not going to operate. So I'm very selective because I'm older now, so I'm very selective in my operate. But when you're younger, you're more aggressive because you want to operate. You, you, you want to operate. When you get to be my age, you don't want to go gray because I'm as gray as I can get anyway. So you become more selective. So that's one of the things I look at. If I have a complication, that patient coming into the office. If the patient that with me coming into the office, 
And sometimes if the patient, I can't sell the patient on surgery, but the patient needs it because the patient's a nervous person, that person's coming into the office. So you can use it as a screening test and then bring them in. So you, 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 you see every patient you indicate surgery pretty much, and you also double checking on your diagnosis if you have any doubts on, on indirect yeah. data. Right. So, from the telemedicine. Yeah, so I'll tell, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. In the last three months, I've operated on 42 people that I never met. I only met them on telemedicine. I met them on the day of surgery. So I am gonna now do a paper on those people to do a survey, were they happy? Because I used to, when I was a young surgeon in a trauma center, and all of you have this experience. Hi, Mr. Johnson, you meet someone for the first day. Hi, Mr. Johnson, you have a broken femur. I'm gonna now operate on you. That's the first time they met you, and then an hour later you're operating. And I would always walk away saying, that person's entrusting their life in me, and I met them an hour ago. I'm having the same feelings with telemedicine during this crisis. This person developed a foot drop and is miserable and met me in the day of surgery. It's the same type of weird feeling. So I'm not meeting these people during the COVID crisis. Outside of a crisis, I think it's important to meet them in your office, to sign the consent forms, to have a face-to-face. -face. I'm not sure I'm going to do that. If, I mean, if a patient signs up with me on telemedicine and they feel comfortable, they're probably going to go with it because it saves me time. But I may not be protected on the downside if something goes wrong. You can imagine if you have a nerve root injury, spinal fluid leak that's bad, and they never met you before, they may be more apt to be more aggressive from a legal perspective because they never really had a good relationship with you. These are things that we just learn. I'm, I'm thinking about because it, it's never happened before. Great, thank you. So, may I have a question? Yep. Sure. Rafa, open, open your screen. Rodrigo, I have a question for the doctor. Sander. Let's do the Pratali and then we'll do the interlocution of the question. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for your participation. It's a big pleasure for us from the Brazilian Spine Study Group. And, uh, well, uh, you, you spent uh, 30 minutes uh, explaining very well uh, how to make the telemedicine uh, feasible and effective, but in terms of uh, consultation. Uh, in my mind, and I, I, I would like to ask you if you, ha if you have the same perspective that, that I have, but in my mind, uh, the, the biggest applicability for the, the telemedicine is the post-operative way, as you can uh, follow up uh, to see how patients are doing the complaints, but also you can uh, do the telemonitoration. You can see uh, how dist uh, what distance is he walking, uh, how are they exercising, uh, the, the parameters like the uh, the the blood flash pressure and uh, if it has pain or not. Uh, I've heard that uh, some uh, studies using uh, games to do tele re rehab rehabilitation with the physiotherapist using games like those games of uh, we uh, to do uh, tele rehabilitation and also uh, what do you think in the fu in future to use the smart glasses to someone help in tele in tele tele surgery. Do, do you think uh, how feasible you you suppose it is? Uh, some surgeon doing sur surgery with a smart glass, and one senior uh, surgeon uh, helps uh, in a in a in a different country, for example, and giving uh, advices and uh, comments during the surgery. So what you've described, uh, I'll start to the first part, was exactly what we did five years ago. It was a post-operative patients seeing their activity. It was really cool and it made so much sense. But what happens is we lost interest because it, 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 it was good because it was a pain in the neck to see patients in the office and then all of a sudden 
oh, by the way, it's 11.15, you have Mrs. Johnson, and all of a sudden you had to stop what you were doing, you have to walk to a different room that had the computer set up, and you're doing a post-op visit. It just, it, it got to be a pain to do because you have to schedule the visits, it, but it made a lot of sense. They didn't have to come back to see you. And then after a while, you say to yourself, well, why should you even be doing that anyway? Why don't you just have your PA do the post-op visit? Because it's just a post-op visit. So all of a sudden, as you get older, you're like, yeah, you'll have an extended care physician or extend, a physician assistant do that. It became sort of a nuisance to do that. So it was great, but it got boring. And then, and then all of a sudden, telemedicine f- fell off because it wasn't that interesting. You didn't get paid that much for it. Now, you're talking about Google Glasses. So Google Glasses came out six years ago, the first concept, and it just never took off. It, it didn't work as well. It was hard to get stuff up. So it's been out there. They have Google Scribe. Google Scribe is you wear the glasses and there's someone in another place looking at the patient through your glasses. And as they're giving you a history, they're scribing the note and stuff like that. So they have that technology now, Google Scribe and Google um, Doc. And it just hasn't really taken off. I've never used it, so I don't know. But I do read about it and it hasn't really gone places. And Google hasn't really pushed it. That's, that's what I, because they, they review it sometimes at the end of the year, like end of the year tech magazines review it. It hasn't really been adopted. So it's an interesting idea. I mean, wearing glasses where someone else could see through your lens to see the person to do scribing makes sense. But then you have drag and voice recognition. So things are cool, but then there's easier ways of doing it that, that are cheaper. Like the cheapest way you can do things is to have someone text you, have, have your nurse text you the H&P on a patient and then text you a video of their MRI scan. And then you look at it, play the MRI scan on your phone, and then you call the patient. That's the easiest telemedicine I've ever seen in my life. And it costs you nothing to do, nothing. So all these things are interesting, but the practical application, when this whole thing is over, I may not be able to do my, my cell phone anymore because the executive order will be rescinded and I'll have to use a computer to do telemedicine. So then I have to see, well, is it easy? I think an iPad, if I can get my iPad to work effectively, I'll, I'll use an iPad. I won't use a computer because it's a pain. And I'll use it in a car if I could tether it to my phone. So that's how I'll use it. We have, we have another question from the audience. I put uh, the microphone on from Alexandre Fogassa. If you want to uh, do your question, Fogasa. Yeah, hi, 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 Dr. Fogasa. You go ahead. No, it's, it's, not, it's not going. Fernando, você tinha uma pergunta? Sim. Eu tenho uma, tenho uma curiosidade específica. Hi, Dr. Alexander. Uh, I have a personality uh, curiosity about how the doctors uh, send out the, the prescribe the control prescribe to the, to the patients? I ask it because here in Brazil, uh, the, our president deny this kind of uh, uh, this kind of send uh, about the prescribe control the prescribe. You know, uh, who, what, what which, which way you use to send the the prescribes control prescribes? Are you talking about prescribing controlled substances? Yes. Yes. We're not allowed to do it on paper anymore. Everything is um, e-scripts. It, it, they, it was October of 2019. You can no longer write out a prescription for narcotics anymore. It had to be electronic. Now, during the COVID crisis, they changed that, and they're allowing it to be written out. Um, the funny thing is, I, and uh, I haven't, uh, and Louis, you want to say something? No. Oh, sorry. I, have a, I haven't written a prescription in like 15 years. My nurse does it for me, but, um, but I, I read the laws and stuff like that. So we got an announcement that as of October, 2019, they can electronically, you have to do it electronically. Now, the, the reason that became interesting is I have 202 doctors in my group and I get a printout every month on how many narcotic prescriptions are written by every doctor. It just gets printed out. And then it does a statistical analysis to see who's two standard deviations above normal, who's one standard deviation. And then they use that information to go after the doctor. 
So you bet you got to hope that you're within the, you know, one standard deviation of all those prescriptions. When they go to electronic prescriptions, they know everything you're doing. There's no such thing as, you know, writing a prescription for, for anybody. Everyone knows it. So that's why they went to it. Nice. Thank you. There's two final questions from the audience, and then we can move to the next uh, topics. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, Alex, uh, by, by our talk, it's clear that under uh, the pandemic, uh, this technology has a big role. Uh, but my, my, and we, we have here been trying to start using this, and I think it's very valuable, especially when we exclude cases. So it's easy, it's very good technology to give an opinion. It's not very good technology to do indications of surgery. And in my yeah, opinion, I, I, I agree. So, surgery so has much yeah. more than just giving an opinion. Talk about that, please. Yeah, so, so you, you do a lot of deformity surgery. This is not good technology for a deformity surgeon where you have to see someone walk into your office. You have to have them. You have, where someone with significant myelopathy, we really need to have an understanding of what's going on. You have to, you have to see the patient move around. This is good for a large disc herniation, you know, a disc herniation to, see, to screen cases. It's a good technology. Or if a patient's had multiple opinions and you want to save time, you're absolutely right. It's, I'm going to adopt 30% of what I'm doing now in my permanent practice. And again, I'm going to use it for efficiencies, like I said before. But this is a horrible thing for deformity surgeons. I mean, the type of x-rays they need, you have to, how you position a patient for an x-ray. Do they have their elbows at their side? Do they have their elbows up? How are they? You can't do any of that in telemedicine. You're going to get these fragmented pictures. So you're right. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to learn more and more and more. You know what the sad thing is? Have you followed? The, I don't have an EO. It's too expensive. So... I lose money if I had EOS. Everyone, all the deformity guys in, the, in America have an EOS machine, and they're all losing money every time they take a picture. So that company was being bought by AlphaTech, as you know, and the deal fell through two weeks ago because of lack of capitalization. It just shows you that technology can't. Be, that, that's so expensive you can't do it. It's, I just that was something interesting during this time period. That's what we need to study the global alignment of the patient, but it's very expensive. <laughs> So we'll see what happens in the future. Okay, just quick questions, Alex, for, for ending this session. Uh, one is about the malpracticing uh, insurance, and that is any, any issue with the insurance for telemedicine. So we, we had to go to our provider, and the one nice thing about the um, COVID crisis is because patients weren't allowed to have elective surgery, they rebated our premium during the telemedicine and they have agreed to cover telemedicine. But some of the malpractice carriers do not. So you have to get a rider to make sure it is. Okay, okay. And the, the last question is a connection for the next, next talk that we will we'll talk about the, the safety of the information and cloud uh, storage and all the technology involving the, the issues itself is about if you have to record all your uh, tele uh, consultations or not. That's a problem. <laughs> That's the next talk? Yeah, the next talk would be uh, in, in, in data uh, safety. Oh. But the question is you... Oh, you to me? Oh, so, so this is it. Every, I've uh, thought, yeah, I've thought about that. So I am definitely not recording my telemedicine. I mean, I, I don't record anything. So we've talked about this multiple times in America. Will the insurance companies require us? Now, in America, there's two types of laws. It depends on what your state is. There's a law where only one party is privileged to know that a recording is occurring. In other states, both parties have to be covered. So if you're in a state where only one party is privileged to the knowledge that a recording is occurring, a patient can record your Zoom call with you. And then you're screwed. Because a good patient attorney can manipulate, well, you obviously didn't talk about this. You talked about these six complications. They developed the seventh, and you didn't talk about it. 
before that, you could say, yeah, I did talk about the possibility of a neurologic deficit, but you didn't talk about this one. See, and then they'll convince a jury that you didn't really explain to the patient that they could have that complication. Recording this stuff is the worst thing that can happen to us in terms of medical legal.